This week we will be looking at the tools geographers commonly use to portray or study the Earth. Obviously, we know geographers use maps and globes, but there are other tools as well. Here are the tools we will cover. Maps and globes, global positioning system, remote sensing, and geographic information systems. Actually, you use or benefit from many of these technologies every day as you use map or traffic apps on your phone, or when you use home delivery from Amazon, or as companies use location-based information to better market their products to you. Indeed, these geographic tools are now widely used by companies, governments, and individuals. Taking just a few classes of GIS in particular can likely give you a very marketable skill. We'll start by defining the terms map and globe and noting some characteristics of each. First, let's look at maps. Maps are flat, two-dimensional, scaled representations of the Earth that show the spatial distribution of selected Earth. Let's look carefully at this definition. Maps are scaled. That means they are not actual size, but rather scaled down versions of reality. That seems pretty obvious, actually. Think about it. Would a map of Redwood City be very useful if the map was the actual size of Redwood City? It's not even possible to create such a map. Also, maps are two-dimensional. This is a problem as the Earth is a sphere. We'll see soon that the process of taking our spherical Earth and mashing it onto a piece of flat paper results in distortion. Indeed, Maps can show distance, direction, size, and shape, but not all at the same time. Because of distortion, no small-scale world map can accurately show both size and shape. So essentially, maps lie. Yes, many maps, especially those trying to show large areas of the Earth, misrepresent size and or shape. Generally, the mapmaker tries to minimize the distortion, but indeed, maps can also be made to intentionally mislead. We have to be critical when we read maps, just as we are critical when we read print information or data on graphs and figures. Notably, despite the distortion of size and shape, maps can show location properly. All maps can do this. Latitude and longitude representations of location are not distorted. In the last part of our definition, we note that maps show selected features. Map makers pick and choose what features are on a map and how the features are represented. Notably, these choices are generally made to make the map clear and readable to the user and to ensure that the goal of the map is attained. However, maps can also be used to mislead folks or sway people's opinions. You need to read maps again with the same critical eye that you use when you're reading a text or looking at data in tables and figures. Notice that the four maps shown here also show the same location. The map maker has selected different features to show on each map, and as a result, these maps have very different looks and, and very different purposes. These maps of Africa and South America show only a few features, but, is, but they are able to effectively get their point across. These maps are pretty elegant, really. It would take an enormous amount of text to convey the same information. Indeed, maps are an incredible tool for understanding spatial distributions, and they even give us clues about why the distributions might exist. They can help us figure out the answers to problems. For example, study the map on the right here, taken from a previous edition of your textbook. I bet you can pretty quickly come up with a hypothesis on what factors might influence population density in South America. Throughout the class, as we look at different maps, and even in your everyday life as you look at maps, we always need to remember that each map was made for a purpose. Trying to use a map for a task that it was not made for can be quite challenging, impossible, or even with the case of the Mercator projection, which we'll discuss later, it can be quite deceptive. Looking at these two maps here, they're both of California, but clearly they have different purposes in mind and would not be very useful for using for something outside of their purpose. One final point about maps. 
They're generally pretty inexpensive to make, and they're really convenient to use. Indeed, maps can be created quickly with the use of computers and digital mapping technology, like GIS, and they can be stored online or folded in your pocket. We could continue on with more and more characteristics of maps, but this is a pretty good start. I encourage you to review the definition of a map shown here, and also think of some of the, the pros and cons of using maps to display spatial data. Next, let's look at globes. Globes are a three-dimensional scaled representation of the entire Earth showing the spatial distribution of selected Earth features. Globes can show the entire Earth, which is great, but in order to do that, they must be very small in scale. Can you imagine how big a globe you would need in order to have a large enough scale globe to show where my house is? Wow! That would be cool, but not very practical. Because they are made at such a small scale, Globes are not able to portray smaller details as well as maps. Another point about globes is that they're three-dimensional. Thus, globes can and do show both size and shape and distance and direction and location accurately. Yay! Indeed, this is one of their biggest assets. Globes are spherical so they can accurately portray the spherical Earth. Maps cannot do this. Maps especially those trying to portray the whole Earth, can never be 100% accurate. One drawback of a globe, though, is that the user can only see half of the Earth at a given time. This trait makes it difficult to use globes to compare features around the world. Also, globes tend to be more expensive than maps, and they can be quite cumbersome. You are probably not going to lug a globe around campus with you, though you'd look really cool if you did. And a larger scale globe would be in pretty much impossible to carry around with you, simply too cumbersome. Just like maps, globes only show selected features, and map makers must choose what to portray and what not to portray on a globe. And also, as we mentioned earlier, by their very nature, they're small in scale, so a lot of features simply cannot be presented on a globe. By now, you should be able to define the terms map and globe, and also fairly quickly rattle off some pros and cons of using each. Additionally, you should be able to know when and for what uses each might be appropriate. Also, I'll state it one last time here to be very clear, maps are never 100% accurate because you cannot accurately display the curved surface of the Earth on a flat piece of paper. That is, you can't display it without distortion. Larger scale maps that likely cover a very small area can better approximate the accurate portrayal of the Earth, but smaller scale maps, especially those trying to show the entire Earth, always sacrifice something. For example, they cannot simultaneously show accurate shapes and accurate sizes. Now that we have a basic understanding of maps and globes, let's look at one important feature of both maps and globes, the map or globe scale. We noted that both maps and globes are scaled down representations of the Earth. Thus, in order to understand how the distance on a map relates to the distances in real life, we need to use a map scale. Map scale, scale can be defined as the relationship between the distance measured on the map and the distance measured in real life. Notably, on a map that shows only a small area of the Earth, the same map scale can often be used throughout the map. The same can be said for all what we call equivalent maps. We'll discuss this term later. However, on conformal maps, which we'll also discuss later, the map scale may be different in different regions of the map. Yikes! In some cases, that could be confusing. In general, there's three types of map scales commonly used on maps and globes, and all three are shown on the map on the right. Graphic scales, shown here, are sometimes called bar scales, use a line that is marked off in distances to represent the distance on the Earth's surface. 
the units should be clearly shown. This type of scale is fairly intuitive to use. See the figure shown here. The graphic scale is marked off in both kilometers and miles. As an example, you could quickly use it to measure from Jacksonville to Trampa. And you'd simply me measure the distance on the map with a piece of paper, or string, or a ruler, and then compare it to the graphical scale. Notably, this scale remains accurate even when the map is enlarged or reduced in size. So that's pretty cool. The second type of map scale is called a verbal scale, and it's shown here. There's two verbal scales shown on this map. Verbal scales, sometimes also called word scales, state in words the relationship between the distance on the map and the distance in real life. You can see the two verbal scales on this map here, 1 centimeter equals 79.2 kilometers, and 1 inch equals 125 miles. These scales are fairly intuitive to use as well. However, you must use caution because the scale is no longer valid if you enlarge or reduce the map. In this case, on this particular slide, I reduced the map, and also your browser may be enlarging or reducing the image as well. Thus, this scale is no longer valid. You need to be very cautious when using a verbal scale on a map on the internet. The third type of scale is called a fractional scale, or a ratio scale. It's shown here as a ratio. These scales are also impacted by enlarging or reducing the map, so be careful. The map here shows a fractional or ratio scale, but is no longer valid due to reduction and enlargement. Fractional and ratio scales are somewhat like the verbal scale, but they are unitless. The scale shown on this map is 1 to 7,920,000. It could also be shown as a fraction. What it means is that one unit on the map equals 7,920,000 units in real life. You might ask, what is a unit? Well, the beauty of these scales is that you get to decide what units you want to use, as long as the same units are used for both the map and for real life. For example, let's use centimeters. Thus, we could say one centimeter on the map equals 7,920,000 centimeters in real life. Going further, let's say you measured three centimeters on the map. Well, if one centimeter was 7,920,000 centimeters in real life, then three centimeters would be what? How many centimeters in real life? Hopefully, you thought to simply multiply by three. So, 23,760,000 centimeters in real life. Of course, writing centimeters is not very useful when you're talking about great distances like that. So you'd want to convert it to meters. So that would be 23,760 meters. And then kilometers. Divide by 1,000, 23.76 kilometers. Be sure to look in Appendix 1 in your textbook for a review of English and metric units and conversions. Also, I went through this example fairly quickly. Pause the video and go do it again yourself. Remember, we measured three centimeters on the map and wanted to know how far that was going to be in real life. Perhaps you prefer to use inches. Go ahead. Here's another example. Perhaps you're someone who likes to hike, and you may have used a topographic map like this one that shows elevation gain and loss. A common scale on this, this type of map is 1 to 24,000. It's hard to see on the bottom of this map, so let me zoom in. So again, one unit on the map equals 24,000 units in real life. If we wrote it as a fraction, it'd be clear why it's unitless. The units would simple can simply cancel out because they're the same units on the top and the bottom. Pause the video here and answer this question. Be sure to pause the video. You're going to have these questions on the homework assignment and on your next exam. It's best that you get some practice in. You're essentially following a path that's five inches long on the map. Every one inch on the map equals 24,000 inches in real life. So how far in real life would that be? First compute how far it is in inches, then convert your inches into feet, and lastly convert your feet into miles. Again, you should have stopped the video to figure this out. Go through the answers carefully, step by step. Did you get it right?
If not, go back and review each step until you feel comfortable.